Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, it's good to see you guys today. It's good to be kind of settling in. It's been a, a crazy uh, couple of months in my house. So I finally feel like this is the first normal uh, weekend we've had in a long time. Just in time for the yard sale to start next weekend. So, <laughs> and I'll have a little more information about that for you in just a moment. But we are so glad you've chosen to worship with us today. Uh, if you're uh, watching us online, we are so happy to have you. Just leave a comment or, or something so we just know you're here. Uh, and our Facebook readers will be with you uh, just to keep our conversations going. If you're here in the building, uh, it's great to see you today. Uh, if uh, I have just a, a if you, any of your information has changed, or maybe you have a prayer request or, uh, or anything, if you would take a minute and fill out the Connect card. Uh, if you're watching at home online, you can scan that code. If you're watching on your phone, take your uh, friend's phone and scan that and fill that out. Uh, or you could uh, get a hold of us on our website or Facebook as well. Uh, the best way to get a hold of us, of course, is through the app. And the best way to do that is to text LFCOG app to 77977. Uh, you can also give online there as well. As our ushers uh, would come and take offering here in the building today, you can give online by scanning that or again, use the app to set up recurring giving. Uh, there's lots of different ways to do that. So um, I have just, just a couple of announcements for you today. I, I already mentioned our yard sale. We have, uh, if you've been in the gym lately, uh, you can see there's some things there that weren't there before, just a handful of things. Uh, but we have more coming. Uh, we do. We have a lot more coming. So we, you can still drop off your yard sale donations. I saw a few folks bringing some things in today. Thank you for that. Uh, but all this week, if you can come and help set up, we're going to be moving some stuff from the gym into other areas of the church. We're going to move the kids' stuff into the uh, the center area where Beth Sunday School classroom is. We're going to move some picture frames and holiday items and books into here. Uh, and so, and then we're going to get more stuff uh, as the week progresses. So if you can help with any of those things, uh, we have been leaving the church doors open. We've had folks come and stay as late as it's 9, 9.30, 10 o'clock in the evenings, and you can show up as early as, you know, 9 or so. If, if you want if you want to come earlier than that, just get a hold of somebody who has a key, and we'll let you in. Uh, so if you want to help set up with that, we could appreciate that. And if you can actually work at the yard sale itself, uh, we still need some folks to help with that. Um, I, I, we definitely will need all hands on deck to help with that. I believe you guys, you guys still have some large furniture items that need picked up as well. So if you can help uh, get some of those items, I think there's just one more trailer load of boxes, and then we need like furniture and stuff that will go outside. So if you can help with any of those things, please get a hold of Sue Cahill or Alan Reed, and we'll, you guys can schedule some time to get together and get some of those items uh, to the building. Uh, so uh, as part of the yard sale setup, and because we're going to be moving stuff all over the place, there'll be no uh, Bible study or youth this Wednesday. Instead, we're just asking you to come out and help set up for the yard sale. There will be landmark kits, and, and we'll try to get nursery available as well if you want to come and help. Uh, we'll have those services available for you uh, so we can use all the help we can get. Uh, and then we look ahead for about a month, and then we have a busy weekend again as our church. We have the, the block party on Saturday, September 10th from 11 to 4. Uh, in the morning, that's also our second Saturday. So, man, we'll get together and have some breakfast and then head over and run this, yard, or run this block party. Uh, or help in any way we can. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Bounce houses, games, school supplies, kids' clothes. Mooney's food truck is going to be up here. Uh, popcorn, snow cones, we're giving away stuff. All kinds of wonderful things. So uh, if you can help with that or, or have any questions, please get a hold of Dana Steele and she'll be able to answer all your questions and tell you exactly what it is that we need you to do. Um, and then the next day, uh, on that Sunday, September 11th, is our church picnic. And so all of our services will be at Camp Creek State Park. Um, and so uh, I have the, as that gets a little bit closer, I'll tell you what shelter we're at and all that information. But just know that that'll be our church picnic. So there will be no service in the building. It will all be at Camp Creek that day. And then just one more thing. Uh, if you have a bulletin, I hope you do. Uh, you'll notice on the very bottom there is it says counters and then right above that it says Landmark Littles 
and we have our nursery workers for this week. Sunday and Wednesday are listed. If you were at the business meeting on Wednesday evening, uh, you heard a desperate plea from Shannon Allen to get some help. We have lost a few nursery workers in the last few weeks, and we're struggling to fit those spaces. And, uh, and I know if you're on the nursery schedule, you've been working it a lot more than you have normally to help make up that time. So if you would like to serve in the nursery, uh, please get a hold of Shannon. We need, we need more help in there. We got babies, and especially coming off of the, the yard sale, and the block party, we're hoping to have more young families in here. We're gonna need help in all of those spaces. So if you have any desire to help in the nursery at all, please get a hold of Shannon Allen. We could definitely use you. Um, I think those are all of the announcements. If you're able, would you stay? Oh yeah, we have one more. So um, as part of the yard sale, the yes. will be doing, right that is part I forgot that thank you yeah on Saturday there will be have hot dogs and baked goods for a sale for purchase to raise money for the youth group so we can go to state youth convention and hopefully international youth convention in the next couple of years so uh, be on the lookout the yard sale is a big event for a lot of facets of this church so uh, would you please stand if you're able to pray with together yes Saturday evening on Mercer Street. We all right Saturday, this Saturday. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so that's this Saturday. Yeah. Okay. So the our Widows Connect group is running some. They're going to have a booth set up at the cruise in uh, over by the Napa Auto Parts on um, this weekend as well. So when you're done with the yard sale, go down and cruise on down Mercer Street and stop in for their bake sale and hot dogs as well. Thank you, Robin. One more thing. I'd see, I'm trying to keep it short, Jamie. This isn't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll announce the announcement about the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday night, Jamie Hill will be doing the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday night, Jamie Hill will be doing the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday night, Jamie Hill will be doing the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday night, Jamie Hill will be doing the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday night, Jamie Hill will be doing the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday night, Jamie Hill will be doing the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday night, Jamie Hill will be doing the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday night, Jamie Hill will be doing the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday night, Jamie Hill will be doing the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday night, Jamie Hill will be doing the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday night, Jamie Hill will be doing the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday night, Jamie Hill will be doing the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday night, Jamie Hill will be doing the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday night, Jamie Hill will be doing the yard sale. Uh, Wednesday Anything we do, that's fair game. Put that out there. The world, we want the world to know. Uh, absolutely, we do. Make sure it's publicized. Thank you so much. Make your own sale. Yeah, do it however you want. Get the word out. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate that. Anything else? These are all wonderful things. I'm not, I don't mean to cut anybody off. It's, Nobody has asked me, uh, nobody's approached me to, to do any baptisms. If somebody would like to, talk to me and we'll get that scheduled at Camp Creek. We'll, we'll, I would love to baptize people there. It'd be great. Anything else? You guys got anything? Right. Just making sure. I never, I never see them. They're always behind I'd, me. I'd like to announce that it's time for us to worship. All right. How about that? If you would, stand to up and let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the opportunities we have to uh, impact this community. And we look at the yard sale as a fundraiser for us, and, and it is that. But it's also an opportunity for us to meet our neighbors, for us to meet people in this community who may never come into a church building. It's also an opportunity for us to really just shine the light of Jesus to people who need it. And it's an opportunity for people to get things that they need that they may not be able to afford otherwise. So we thank you for opportunities to serve. We thank you for opportunities for fellowship. We ask that you would speak to us through worship today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
service, I'm, I'm, Amberly, I'm going to talk about your daughter for a minute. Amanda and I were just admiring her, and she's so cute, and she's singing songs back there, all her own. And um, Amanda said, she just doesn't even know how loved she is. And, you know, isn't that how it is when you look at a, a child, and they're just, they're so precious. They're so wonderful. They're so cute. And you just want to hug them, and you just want to hold them, and... You know, just let them know how wonderful they are. But you guys, God looks at us the same way. I mean, we are not as cute as her. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we've, we've, got, we've got some bruises on the inside, but God still looks at us and he's like, that's my child. I made that child. I am so, so proud. And the thing is, we've done, we've all sinned. But we are chosen by God, and we are forgiven by God. So if you're carrying a heavy burden today, just remember, there is a Father who truly loves you, and he wants you to come to him. And just, just think of little Amelia, and you can sing along with Amelia, too.
Job 33, 4.
Lord, we just breathe in your presence this morning and we thank you for meeting us here. Lord, it's so good when we can sense your closeness. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would soften our hearts and draw us and draw us and draw us and give us a hunger for more of you, more of your word, more time in prayer. And Lord, help us to just get where we can't do anything else until we meet with God. Lord, we just breathe it in this morning and we thank you for your presence here. Lord, we ask that for your blessing in everything that's said and done in the rest of the service. God, you're going to do great things today. I know it. Help us to be receptive. Open our hearts so we can do whatever it is you want us to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we are going to let our kids go on to Children's Church. So see you later, kids. Have fun. And big people, we can stay and shake hands. Greet someone around you. <laughs>
that comes with knowing that everything's going to be okay. God's in charge. The waves and wind and whatever other storms come our way, God's got it. We don't have to have it. That's hard for some of us. I'm a little bit of a control freak, and so that's hard for me to know that I'm not in charge of those things. But there's comfort in knowing that God is in charge. And that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Somehow, I'll tie that in because I just talked about it. Now I have to. So, uh, But uh, before we get into it, Lauren and I and do just want to say thank you so much uh, for everyone who celebrated uh, my ordination last weekend. It was a wonderful Sunday. Uh, it was good to have my family here. It was good to see our church family here. Uh, a few folks we hadn't seen in a while, and, and the Hodge family coming to do worship with us was great. And uh, we were just really blown away by... Uh, the showing of support from everyone here in the building and for those who watched uh, you can check it out online it was wonderful um, I don't like to admit it uh, but there was a moment uh, or two uh, maybe even three uh, where I just got a little bit emotional uh, just because of everyone here to support us and our family and that's just something you don't get uh, you know I've been in church most of my life I don't know how people outside of church do things without the support system that you have that we have here so Thank you for that. It, it was a great day. They didn't ordain me for nothing, so we got to talk about the Bible today. So uh, we're going to get into God's Word this morning and share some truth together. Uh, would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for this reminder this morning that you, you're in control. And you are sovereign. You are ruler over all things. Sometimes that's scary, but sometimes there's great peace and there's great comfort in that when we go through some difficult things or there's difficulties looming, we know that those things are under your control. God, we ask that you help us to rest in that, to find peace in that, to be people who live in that peace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. So, um, I know that I have a tendency sometimes to overshare. Um, at least that's what my wife tells me. She overshared right there. Uh, but I'm going to do it again because, uh, but you guys want to know a weird thing about me as a parent that I have recently discovered, that uh, when someone looks at my boys and says something like this, like, they're so tall, it just makes me so proud, <laughs> right? Um, and, and you might be thinking, like, that's, that's not weird, like, everybody does that, right? Uh, and, you know... Like, it's not weird, and you don't know that it's weird, because like me, you, you probably do it too with your kids or grandkids. If they say they're handsome, or they're cute, or they're pretty, or they're sweet, or, well, not sweet, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but when they, if they say they're handsome, they're pretty, they're thin, or they're beautiful, or whatever, it probably makes you very proud, right? Like if somebody says, talks about your kids and comments on them, oh, they're so pretty, they're so handsome, it just makes you so proud, they're so tall, whatever. Right? Um, because we've been taught by the world to put a lot of importance on physical things, physical appearance. Like, it shouldn't make me proud my boys are tall. They didn't do anything to earn that. Right? It has nothing to do with their character. It's just a physical trait. It's, there's nothing they can do to change that. Right? And so when people comment on physical appearance, we get so proud, but, but that's because the world always looks at the outside. And just because we exist in this world, we have a tendency to do that from time to time as well. And I'm not saying that that's bad. It's, it's, it's okay to be proud of your kids' physical traits. Like, that's okay. But that's not all there is. It, it shouldn't necessarily make me proud that they're tall because, again, they didn't earn that. It wasn't something they said or something they did. It wasn't a personality trait. It's just a statement of fact. 
Now, when somebody says, oh, your kids are tall or your kids are small or whatever it is that makes you happy, just know that's a statement of fact, and you can live with that and be happy with that fact. But humanity has been looking at physical stature as a predictor of success forever. This is not new to us. This is not something that suddenly I had some great realization, I'm going to write a book and become a millionaire. And people have been doing this forever. As, as long as time, as long as people have existed, we've looked at the outside things and, and put uh, markers of success based on what somebody looked like. And unfortunately, there are some statistics that back that. Handsome people or pretty people tend to do well in business. They tend to make more money than not handsome or pretty people, however that is defined. But, but the truth is, uh, we see it in the Old Testament even. See, when Saul was chosen as Israel's king, we're going to look at a description of him in just a minute from 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Then look how he's described here. Um, there was a Benjamite, a man of standing. A Benjamite means he comes from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphia, of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. We get a description the first time we meet King Saul. It's about, they give us his lineage, and then it's about how he looks. He's handsome, as handsome as could be found anywhere, and taller than everyone else. Handsome and tall, right? Those are his descriptions. There's no mention of his character, there's no mention of his leadership ability, his devotion to God. There's no mention of his past successes or defeats. There's no list of, there's no resume there. It's just he was handsome and tall. Moving on, right? That's it. And, and so it's all about his physical appearance. We see later that he was even surprised that God wanted him to be king because he didn't have the, the character traits to back that up. Right, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, uh, starting in verse 17. And we're going to go through 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 24. I know there's a lot there. Stay with me. It says, When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, This is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. See, the people wanted a king. They really, really, really wanted a king because they wanted to be like everyone else. You know, like when your kids come to you and they're like, uh, Can I stay up late tonight? Or can I have this video game? Or can I do this thing? And you're like, no. And they're like, but everybody else is doing it. The Israelites did the exact same thing to God. And they're like, God, can we have a king? And he's like, I'm your king. You don't, you don't need anybody. And they're like, but everybody else has one. <laughs> and so he's like, fine, you can have one. And so he told Samuel the prophet that, look, they want a king. I'll give them one, whatever, whatever. And so that's when we did find out about King Saul. And so we skip a few verses down, and we get from 1 Samuel chapter 9 down to 17, and then we get 18. It says, Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, would you please tell me where the seer's house is? See, King Saul's, well, he's not king yet, but Saul's dad lost some sheep. And so Saul and a couple servants have to go find the sheep, and they can't find him. It's been like three days, and they're like, where are these things? And, and the servant is like, oh, there's a seer, there's a prophet, there's a man of God that lives in this town. Let's ask him. I bet he knows where the sheep are. And so they, they find him, and, and Saul doesn't even know who Samuel is. He's the prophet of God for the entire nation of Israel, and Saul doesn't know who he is. That should tell you something about his character. But he's like, where's, he bumps into this dude in the gateway, and he's like, hey man, can you tell me where the seer is? And Samuel's like, that's me. I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up ahead of me to the high place, because they worshiped on top of mountains, because it was closer to God, at least they thought. For today you are to eat with me, and in the morning I will send you on your way and will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys, sorry, not sheep, donkeys. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, don't worry about them. They have been found. And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and your whole family line? Saul answered, but I am not, I was like, am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord and Mizpah. 
and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities. And you have said, No, appoint a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. Look, I'm holding a meeting. You wanted a king. I'm going to give you one. Right? When Samuel had all Israel come forward by tribes, the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. Then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and Matri's clan was taken. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was taken. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. So they inquired further of the Lord, has the man come here yet? Like where He got picked to be king. Where, where is he? Is he not here yet? And the Lord said, Yes, he's hidden himself among the Ziklops. He just got said, hey, look, you're going to be king of Israel. There's this big assembly, and his name is pulled out of a hat or whatever it is that they do by casting lots, right? And then they're like, well, where is he? And God's like, oh, yeah, he's hiding. <laughs> God had to tell them he was hiding. He must have been really good at hiding. They ran and brought him out, and as he stood among the people, here it is again, he was a head taller than any of the others. He's so tall. He's going to be a great king. We actually know, the, the U.S. Army knows, that having people too tall is actually bad. They're easy targets, right? But back then, the big dude was in charge. That's how it worked. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There was no one like him among all the people, because he's handsome and the head taller than everybody else. <laughs> then the people shouted, long live the king. And that's how King Saul became king. Right? Isn't that weird? Right? That's why it was such a surprise when God chose David as the next king. Saul didn't have the character. We saw a peak of it. He was a coward. He ran and he hid. When it was time for him to step up and, and claim uh, the throne, he was hiding among the supplies. But they chose him, and they were happy, they were excited, because he was handsome and tall. And that's why when, when God chose David as the next king, it was a little bit surprising. He, he wasn't tall. He wasn't even a man yet. Saul was 30 years old when he became king. David was like you know, 10, 11, or 12 when he was anointed. And the Bible, some translations say that David was handsome, but some say he was ruddy, which just means he just kind of looked like a kid. That's what he was. He didn't look like a king. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13 tell us kind of that story. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? And so Saul did some stuff he shouldn't have done. He didn't follow directions. He didn't listen to what God had told him to do. He offered a sacrifice when only the priest was allowed to do that. And then he, he disobeyed God's orders and didn't destroy everyone he was told to destroy. And God's like, look, you're just done. You're gone. You're like, you had your chance. You blew it. You messed it up. There's no coming back from that. You didn't follow my directions. And so Samuel is pretty upset about it because he had his heart set on Saul. He was trying to... You ever, you ever meet somebody that's a little bit down and you're like, oh, I can fix them. This is more, typically happens to ladies more often than men, but you guys know somebody like that that you just want to fix people? Samuel was a fixer. And he was so upset that he couldn't fix Saul and make him the king that God wanted him to be. He was in mourning. And so the Lord says to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? I've rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. It's like, look, get over it, Samuel. I got another guy to be king. I got another one. This is going to be great. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one that I indicate. This time God is picking. Samuel did what the Lord said. He, when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Because they know he's a prophet of God. And sometimes when a prophet shows up in your town, bad things are on your way. So they're freaked out. And, and so Samuel replied, yes, I come in peace. Uh, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. 
Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, that's Jesse's oldest son, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Why? Because he is handsome and tall. We'll find that out in a little bit. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. Sorry, tall people. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart, character. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. That's his second son. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by. Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? I told you to bring them all with me. Is this everybody? Oh, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered. Anybody with more than two kids? Sometimes you forget you have an extra one. <laughs> He's tending the sheep. Say, I only have two. Sometimes I forget them. I lose them. Right? Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Like, look, I told you to bring all of the kids. He's like, oh, yeah, I forgot. There's the other one out with the sheep. And we'll bring him. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And then Samuel left and went to Ramah. He didn't look like one. He, he wasn't a head taller than everyone else. He was just a kid. He was different. Because the Lord doesn't look at what people look at. He doesn't look at outward appearances. He looks at our heart, our character. God makes it clear it's not about looks. It's what's on the inside that counts. Have you ever heard that before? Right? But so true. David's character was better. Um, there's a, a passage in there after Saul has been deposed or God's spirit leaves Saul where he tells Samuel, he's like, look, the next king will be a man after my own heart. And, uh, Acts chapter 13, uh, and Paul's writing about this and reminds his hearers about this. In Acts 13, 22, it, it kind of states it this way. It says, after removing Saul, he made David their king, and God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. It's about character. Saul didn't have the right character. He didn't follow directions. He was First he was terrified, and then he got prideful. But David God says, he'll do the things I want him to do. He'll follow my directions. Now, at this point in history, in 2022, right, we know that character matters. Uh, we have so many tools to evaluate character. We have personality inventories. We have success metrics. We have all these things in business uh, that can tell you, you know, when you're going to hire someone, you can, you got all these hoops to make people jump through. You can look at someone's resume. You can look at their past successes. You can call and get character references, right? They don't call them just references anymore. They're character references. Cause I don't, I can look on a paper and see what this person has done, but tell me about who they are. We know that that matters when we go to hire somebody, right? And we have all these tools to evaluate that. And a lot of us would even read the story of Saul and say something like, well, well, he failed because he wasn't equipped for the job, right? He didn't have the experience or uh, the skills or the experience necessary to be the king. And you would be absolutely right. He did not have the skills or experience necessary to be the king, right? Um, but he also didn't have the right character. As we saw in that very first passage, right, he was a coward. And then he didn't follow directions, and he was arrogant. And I've mentioned this a few times, but uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses uh, 5 through 14, kind of tell us exactly what happened. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, 
and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore, a whole bunch of people. They went up and camped at Michmash, that's a fun name, Michmash, yeah, east of Beth Avon. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and in cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. They ran away. They crossed the river. Like, I don't want any part of this battle. But Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. Samuel was like, look, wait seven days, and then X, Y, Z is going to happen. You guys are going to win. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. And Saul replied, well, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled, felt like it was a good idea to offer the burnt offering. You've done a foolish thing, Samuel said, because you didn't follow direct. Samuel showed up. He just, Saul just didn't wait long enough, right? You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. And, and later on in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 34, Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent you, sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites, and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. And so Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Elaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, Go away, leave the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all of the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shore near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites. What's that word? Alive. What was he supposed to do? This is interactive. Yeah, kill them all. You know, he didn't do that. And all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. What did God tell him to do? Get rid of everything. Did they do it? No, they did not, right? These were, they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed those. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I've made Saul king because he's turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. He made a statue of himself because he's like, yeah, I won. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I've carried out the Lord's instructions. Did he, though? No, he's a liar. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What then is this lowing of cattle that I hear? I'm glad you guys laughed. That is funny. Samuel's like, oh, you did. And then like a sheep just walked by. <laughs> oh, come on. Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord, your God. Not my God, your God. 
but we totally destroyed the rest. You guys have, you guys have kids. Right? You know, when you tell them to do something, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, we, uh, we, we didn't do that. But we did everything else we were supposed to do, right? Oh, I forgot to make my bed, but I cleaned my toys, uh, shuffling them under the bed. Right? <laughs> okay? Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag their king. That wasn't in the list of things to do. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, and in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. He's just repeating himself because he knows he's caught. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? David tells us later in the Psalms, like, like you don't delight in burnt offerings or I would give you one. You just want me. Character matters even more than burnt offerings, right? To, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. It's like, look, God is God, like sacrifices or whatever. He just wanted you to do what you were told. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And then Saul said to Samuel, now he gets it. I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. He didn't have the right character. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king of Israel. Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him in chains, and he thought, Surely the bitterness of death is past. He's like, Oh, great, the prophet's here. I'm going to go home. But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Samuel was not messing around. When Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. He didn't follow directions. He didn't have the right character. He didn't have a backbone. He lied about it. He didn't have character. But we've grown accustomed to using character as a predictor of success, but that all starts with God. Like when we look at people now, or we know that it's not what's on the outside that matters. It's who they are. What have they done? What kind of a person are they? All that starts with God. It started with him. That's not a new idea for us, right? He chose Noah based on his character. He chose Abraham because of his character. And we see that he chose David because of his character. The same is true of the prophets and many others, because in God's eyes, character matters more than anything else. So you might be hearing this, and maybe you're here in the building, or maybe you're watching online, and you're like, well, Pastor Jeff, I don't judge people by how they look. It's 2022. Nobody does that anymore. I wish that was true. 
maybe you individually don't have never judged anybody by the way that they look. Maybe, right? And, and while society is making great strides to stop making judgments by the way people look, it's not entirely gone. People are still judged by the outside, but sometimes it's not the way that you look necessarily. It may not be by your, your skin color or, or whatever, but people still judge people by other things besides character. Maybe you've experienced this. Maybe it's happened to you, or maybe you'll be honest enough to say that you have done it before, right? People uh, are still judged by things like age. For example, when you're in uh, the wheel of a vehicle and you see a teenager driving, and you are not yourself a teenager. Do you not make judgment upon them? Or maybe you're on the younger end of the spectrum and you see somebody who's more experienced than you behind the wheel. And you may say to yourself, why didn't they take their license away? Right? Maybe you have been on one or both ends of that spectrum. Right? Maybe, uh, maybe it's, it's weight. Maybe it's the way that somebody is dressed. Maybe it's by the vehicle they drive or the house that they live in. Maybe even the family that they come from. Right? Humans still have a tendency to judge people based on things besides character. Those things don't matter in God's eyes. Only character matters. But it's a two-edged sword there. Not only are we, as God's people, supposed to judge others by their character, that also means that people are supposed to judge us by our character. So we have to examine ourselves and say, well, what kind of character do I have? If you have poor character, you'll be rightfully judged by that. We're called to have godly character, to live like Jesus in the world, to, to operate out of a place of peace, like Shula's song said, when we recognize that God is sovereign and we're not. If you're a control freak, that's not godly character. If you're a coward like Saul, that's not godly character. If you're arrogant, that's not godly character. If you lie or cheat or steal, that's not godly character. If you're lazy, are, are, are you hateful? or petty, or spiteful, or bitter, or quick-tempered? Do you gossip? And in church, we never gossip. We only share prayer requests. <laughs> Actually, I'm glad you caught a sarcasm there. There's no place for that. That's not godly character, even if we try to gussy it up. King Saul even said, oh, the men kept the cattle to make sacrifices to God. They didn't follow directions, and he tried to hide it and cover it up. And we do the same thing sometimes with our character, right? There's no place for these character traits in the child of God. Not that we're perfect, by no means. But if you notice these things, and you're just like, ah, it's fine. It's not fine, according to God, because character matters. As a Christian person, your character matters. We're called to be different. And there's lots and lots and lots of scriptures about the way that we should live, but uh, I'll just give you two. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. But you, man of God, or woman of God, person of God, child of God, whatever you want to put in there, flee from all this. There was a big list of negative things, but pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Has anyone ever described you with any of those characteristics? That's the character we should strive for. And Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 26. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, but rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Has your character been described as loving? If you bite and devour each other, watch out, for you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Look, we, before Jesus, before the Holy Spirit comes in, we don't have godly character, because we're not godly. Why it always still surprises me when we get surprised that like sinners sin that like non-christian people do dumb things or they do things that are like bad 
Like they don't have the spirit of God. They don't have godly character. And neither did we until the spirit came in and changed our lives. So live by the, walk by the spirit. Allow God to change you. And you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Your character will change. The flesh desires what is contrary or opposite or fighting against the spirit. And the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. These are all bad things. Right? And envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. The Spirit of God isn't in any of those things. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Your old character has died. You've killed it. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Don't do that. There's no reason for that. No room for that. Character matters. I guess if I could summarize everything today. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance or the family name or the car they drive or how much money they have or a list of other things. But the Lord looks at the heart. Character matters. Character matters. So as we close today, we're challenged to do two things. Reflect on our character. What kind of a character do we have? What, uh, and if you're not sure, ask some people around you. Ask, ask people who give you an honest opinion. And if, they, if nobody around you will give you an honest opinion of, your, of you, then you, that should tell you all you need to know about some of your character. If everyone around you is afraid to give you an honest assessment. Right? But if you're not sure, reflect on your own character. What kind of a character do you have? Not that you're perfect, but at least that we're striving to be different from the rest of the world. And then the second thing, right? make a point to discover someone else's character before passing judgment on them. Or, this is the easy route, just don't judge them at all. You either get to know somebody before you make decisions, or just don't judge people. Church has been accused of that for a long, long time because we're looking at other things besides character. Character <clears throat> matters. Let's pray together. God, help us to be people of your character.